Hello, everyone. Thank you again for joining Dorsey Ross on this episode of The Dorsey Ross Show. In this episode, Dorsey interviews another special guest that will give you hope and inspire you. Hello, everyone. Thank you again for joining me on another episode of The Dorsey Ross Show. Today, we have a special guest with us. His name is Brandon Gano. He is a visionary entrepreneur who turned frustration into a successful business, which he built, franchised, and later sold for significant profit. Now with his business partner and friend, Shane, Shane Delaney, he's pioneering an unprecedented approach to educate and empower small business owners to achieve business growth like never before. Landon, thank you so much for joining me today. I am so happy to be here, Dorsey. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. Well, I usually like to start off with a um, icebreaker. So where did you grow up and did that affect who you became? Yeah, that's that's a good question. So I grew up in the middle of New Jersey. It was a town called Bridgewater, a relatively big town these days. And did it shape me? I would say, I mean, it has to, right? Wherever wherever you are in life, at whatever stage you're at, I think it always shapes you in some way. If I was to think about, you know, the ways it shaped me, it definitely made me want to get away from people from some extent. Not that I have anything about people, but it's a very crowded town. And as I was growing up, it started to get just more and more crowded with stores, uh, subdivisions, all that fun stuff. And I just wanted to find a little breathing room. So I think it's definitely shaped me and actually prompted the move uh, to where I am now in, in North Carolina, in the Raleigh area, where things are a little bit more spread out. But no, it was overall, it was a pretty good place to grow up. Yeah. Now, you're, you're, you know, you, men- you mentioned, actually, I mentioned that you're a, you're a business owner, you're, you know, you're a Christian business owner. So can you share with us a little bit of your faith, your Christian story? Yeah, so I actually, I was introduced to faith more from the religion side growing up. Um, I was raised Catholic. My parents, my grandparents were Catholic. And for me, it wasn't wasn't anything special. It was a ritual. You go to CCD classes uh, once a week through kindergarten to eighth grade which was annoying. I never wanted to go. I'm not a school person anyway. So you're telling me I have to go to more school about topics I don't understand, like not cool for me. And then you go to church and you stand up, sit down, stand up, sit down, kneel, and then leave. And nobody talks to each other. So I was like, why are we doing these things? It doesn't, it doesn't make sense. And it wasn't really integrated into our lives. So I you know, went to college. That was my, my break free moment, if you will, where I was able to... Um, not, I never like explored any other religions or anything like that, but I was just like, all right, my life didn't really change not going to church on Sundays. And I, I don't really know what that was anyway. I just know I didn't like it. So long story short, fast forward to pretty much until, well, after I was married, right before we left New Jersey, we tried another church. It was a Christian church this time. And it was, it was more about like the rock concert at the church than Jesus. So <laughs> It was kind of cool. Like at the time, I was like, all right, this is awesome. Like there's people here. They're fun. Uh, but then as we started to get into it, I realized that those people who were there on Sunday morning, uh, I had a local business in the area and I would deal with some of them on Monday through Friday. And they were two different people. The same person is two different people. And I was like, wait a minute. This also doesn't make sense because you're saying you're one thing on Sunday and then you're saying you're something completely different for the rest of the week. Really from Sunday afternoon until the following Sunday morning, you are a different person. So I, again, just started to question some of that stuff. And when we moved down here, we, I said, let me, I have to try this again. Like I really, I, I felt God calling me back to the church really through my wife. So <laughs> praise, praise her for sure. And praise God. But we went, we found this church, it's called Faith Baptist Church. And it has been incredible. I mean, the focus of the message is only ever about the relationship with Jesus and being what the Bible calls a Christian and as a church too. So 
it is, I mentioned to you before we started recording, I actually, uh, we're recording this on a Friday morning. Friday morning is my Bible study, our men's group. So there's about 20 of us, 15, 20 of us that get together every Friday and we dive deep into the Bible and relate that to, of course, our lives, our challenges, our struggles, our businesses. And it's just a beautiful way to have that hope and that faith and know that you get that a couple times a week. And it's not this religious thing anymore. It's a, it's a faith and it's a relationship. So very long winded story. I'm sorry for that, but uh, it took me a while to get here. And that's, that's, I think the whole point is like, everybody has a different story. That's cool. mine. Um, but hopefully that inspires somebody to continue pursuing or find Jesus for the first time. Right. Now you mentioned what in our discussion before we, you know, before we're doing this now, that you were doing, you had one business, and you, you kind of said that you were like struggling with that business. Not maybe struggling financially, but just struggling with how you were dealing with it. But then you went to, you know, more, um, you, you implemented it into another business, implemented your faith into that more, and you said you were doing better with that with that business how how does that how did that will you do that yeah so that last business which is the one that you kind of mentioned in my bio there yeah i mean it was it was a great business it made money uh it was successful it kind of blew up and was successful relatively quickly and unexpectedly and big things came from it but what i was struggling with was i lost a passion for it and it was because i i kind of realized along that journey this was up in new jersey i went from chasing the mission of what I started the business to solve really the problem that it solved in the world and in the marketplace. And I shifted to chasing money and dollar signs. And I felt empty and I felt uh, hopeless because I had it, it made money. I was profitable. I had all these things. None of it fulfilled me, which I know is not a story unique to me, but it, that's I started to pursue bigger and better things and wanted to make the business even bigger and even more profitable. And it was really in a disservice to my employees at the time, uh, our customers, and the vision of the business. So that's where I did turn it into a franchise. I went through that process, focused on the dollar signs, and it started to just become more and more apparent that the company I partnered with was a snakes, we'll say. They were just not good people. And they were selling these franchises to people and lying through their teeth about what they could produce. So ultimately, they were saying things like, if you invest in this franchise, um, it's going to cost you, the franchise fee was like forty or $50,000. You pay that by the end of the first year in business, uh, you don't have to work at all, and it's going to produce a million dollars for you. And I was like, what, like, where, how did I get here? How did we even get to this, this spot right now? Um, and I felt disgusting about myself, to be honest with you. So that's really where the struggle came in because I invested all this time and money and it was my dream to make this business into a franchise. And I, I had that moment of where I just, you know, I kind of snapped out of the trance I was in, if you will. And I was like, this is not right. Like, I hate this. I hate everything about it. So I canceled all of our contracts. I, we ripped up basically that that business and and completely abandoned it before we stole anybody's money, thank God. I said, well, I'm not involved with this anymore. And then the other, my original location, I completely fell out of love with it. And that's where the struggle was too, because I was like, I don't want anything to do with this industry. I don't want anything to do with this business. And I ended up selling it in the middle of last year at this point. So I was able to kind of wipe my hands clean and walk away, but I still had that passion to serve small business owners and really give people the gift of business ownership, not business operatorship. And that's when I met my business partner, Sean, who again, you mentioned in the bio, he has the very same passion, but he comes from a background of consulting the biggest companies in the world, Nike, Uber, Johnson & Johnson. He's been doing this for 25 years and he's really, really effective at making very complex things extremely simple and scalable. And that's now what we do with our business, with our consulting business. We are both uh, Christian men, incorporate faith very heavily into what we do. And we have just seen that because we've come together on them, and I firmly believe God brought us together because there's no other way that we would have met. <laughs> not, not even by chance should we have ever met and, and gone into business together. But it's just been, it's been one of those things that's 
it's effortless, right? When you know it's delivered from the Lord and it's, it's your purpose and your path, it's not hard. I don't wrestle with doing the work that we do every day like I did in that last business. I feel just completely at ease and guided. So it's been, for me, that's been the biggest difference, which I, I didn't even know was possible because you always hear things like, oh, business is hard, running a business is hard, being an entrepreneur is hard. No, it's not. Not if it's your calling. You'll, you'll, you know that, first of all, the Lord has your back. And second of all, you're on your path. So yeah, challenges come up, but that doesn't make it hard by any means. Yeah. How would you, what encouragement would you give to uh, Christian owners or, or people of faith, you know, who know God and who trust in God, who may be, you know, struggling, who may be dealing, you know, with, you know, finance, who, who may be dealing with, you know, you know, sales are down, you know, people are not coming into their store, think of that nature, you know, they're, they're dealing with the big, you know, they're competing against the big box, you know, retailers. What encouragement would you give to them? Yeah, so, I mean, what we teach people is a, a business model or a business operating system that focuses on simplicity and then scalability. So, my question in that scenario would be, are you struggling or are you going through this because you're listening to what the world has to say? Or is it because is this truly what God has told you to do? Because we talk to a lot of people and they say we want to, when they come to us, we want to grow our business. We want to make more money. We want to have more time. And like, that's cool. Those are great reasons to, to consult with somebody. But why? I mean, why do you actually want to grow your business? And that, pe that makes people think for a minute because the world tells you you have to grow your business. I'm never going to tell you you have to. I can show you how. I can show you a very simple way how to do that. But it's not really about what I want. It's about what you want for you, your community, your family, yourself, and your purpose. So we, I've talked to a lot of people that don't have a good answer to that question. And they're struggling because they think they should grow or they think they should be this big thing and they shouldn't they it's not what god has them to do ultimate our job is to spread the good news spread the gospel right so what if you could be a solopreneur and perfect example one of my good friends in, in my faith group he's a carpenter like a general contractor he does home maintenance work every house he goes into he gets to spread the good news and talk to people about jesus and the gospel he doesn't, he's making money, he's paying his bills, he's happy, and he's doing his work on this earth. He doesn't have to scale his business. If he doesn't, he doesn't really want to, if God isn't calling him to, that's totally fine. Could he run it more efficiently and profitable? Maybe, but it doesn't mean he's got to be this general contracting company doing $25 million in revenue with, with 50 employees. That would be out of line for him. So that's really where I want to start with people is, why are you struggling? Is it your choice because you're following worldly things and worldly advice? Or are you really just not clear on how to get from where you are to where God has pointed you to be? And ultimately, that's that between you and him. If it's a business structure thing, that's where I come in. But I really try not to intercede with people between them and their message from God because that's, that's just a one-on-one -on -one conversation. Sure. Talking about the 4D delete, delegate, delay, and do, how can a business owner leverage the strategy? Yeah, so that's something we talk about a lot. As far as when people do go into business and they want to scale, when they have employees, when they have a team, typically uh, what we'll see entrepreneurs do is they start doing everything. And they get more into that operator side of things, right? Instead of the business owner. And what ends up happening is everything that comes in, they want to say yes to it, whether that's uh, a question from an employee, whether that's a, an order from a customer or a, a contract from somebody. And we need to just pause and say, is this in line with our mission, our vision, and who we are as a company and who I am as the leader of this business? So the order that people tack this in is do, delay, delegate, delete, which is backwards. But those four things, it, very simply what they mean is 
if something comes in, they ask, can I do this? And they immediately try to say yes or justify why it's a yes. Then they say, okay, I can't, I can do it now. Can I delay it? But then still also do it myself. If that's still a no, then they say, okay, can I delegate it to somebody else? Because I'm sure this is important and it must get done. And then the last question we ask is, if everything else is a no, well, then I guess, can we delete it? Like, can this just go away and disappear? And our argument is actually the opposite. So if you want your time freedom back, if you want that clarity and serenity from owning and operating a business, you should actually be looking at things through the other lens. So first, can I delete it? Does this thing actually add value to anybody? And is it in line with our mission? Uh, if it's a no, then just delete it and forget about it. If it's, if it's a yes, that we do have to do it and we have to, it's in line with our mission, it serves our customer, then can we delay it? And it, the delay phase doesn't necessarily mean you still have to be doing it, but does it have to be done right now? So when we consult with our clients, we want them to be laser focused on just a few things every single quarter. So if this thing, whatever it is, if it's an opportunity or a challenge or a question that comes up, if it's not in line with what we are doing this quarter, we don't even look at it till next quarter. Assuming we can't delete it, we delay it till next quarter. If we can't get past that, it's actually urgent, it's very important, and we have to handle it. Can somebody else delegate it, or can we delegate it to somebody else? And that's like that very last step before we're claiming it as something that gets on our calendar. If we can't delegate it, ideally we can, but if we can't, it has to be done, it's urgent, it has to be done by us, then we say, okay, that thing does make it to our calendar. We still try to push things off as long as possible and say like, okay, I'm in the middle of writing an email right now. Can this wait like a day or an hour? So you just want to get out of that squirrel brain mentality is really what we're getting at. So we try to delete, delay, delegate. And then if we have to, we do as the business owner or entrepreneur. We call those things above the golden line. Everything that you have to do is the golden line. Those are the things that you should be doing if you want to grow your business, those are the things that grow your business. If you want to reclaim your time, those are the things that are going to help you get more time back. Or if you're just serving your customers at a high level, those are the things that you're focused on. So it's this framework that we teach our clients to give them the freedom of decision making, because that's the thing that really bogs most people down. It's just making useless decisions in most cases. So we start there and then we can talk about what we're actually doing. Now, you mentioned the a golden line. Tell us a little bit more about that and how does that work into the business framework? Yeah, so the golden line is if you were to picture that framework kind of stacked on top of each other, delete, delay, and delegate are all below that line. If it's above that line, those are owner or CEO type tasks that need to be done. So think of things like your strategic planning, your planning your company vision, uh, making your execution map, hiring in some cases. These are the things that they produce the biggest outcomes and they take the least amount of hours typically to do. So if you, if you run through that filter, you decide you do have to do something, whether it is the hiring or the strategic planning, then you put it on your calendar. So we just say, we call it above the golden line because kind of a metaphor for like, those are the things that should be making the company the most money in the long term, And that's why the CEO ultimately has to do them. Same thing at, you know, any Fortune 500 company, you look at what the CEO does, it is usually the most profitable work. They're planning for the future, setting the company up for profitable success and growth. So when you start to think about your time in that way, we take those things and put them on your calendar. So they actually get done and they get done first and in priority. So that's why everything else becomes sort of meaningless at that point. Because if you know that that one activity, let's just say that next Monday morning, you were to block out four hours on your calendar for the next quarter's strategic plan. If you could knock out your whole strategic plan, and then you identify that you're actually going to be able to grow your company's um, revenue by 35% with this plan, why would you do anything else like answering an email, sending a text, uh, scrolling on social media, whatever it is, if if the the side by side comparison is I can either sit down for four hours and grow my revenue by 35% or I can like a post on Instagram. Any normal person would slap themselves if they chose Instagram. So we just want to get people in that mindset of saying, is this the right work for me? 
Is this what I should be focused on? And is it in line with my vision? And when you can kind of get there quickly, that's the whole thing. It's getting in that habit of just being able to answer that question very, very quickly. Now, would, would that work with even the more business owners who don't have many employees, who only have two or three employees where the CEO or the owner of that store may have to do some of those things below that golden line. Yeah, and there's no shame in that either. So don't let me sound like I'm saying that you should feel bad for doing it. We've all been, if you started a business, you've probably bootstrapped it or been by yourself, at least in the very beginning. Very rare scenario where you're funded by venture capital and you have immediately a team of 50 people. So I'm not talking to those people. But for everybody else, the normal people like us, no, but we still want to go through this framework because you want to start to identify what are the things that I'm saying I can delete? What are the things I'm saying I can delegate? Because you'll start to see patterns. You can still delete and delay even without a team, but the delegate one is the big piece because I I actually even have a, a setting on my calendar to any meeting that comes up or any task that I do that I believe could be delegated I classify it as a different color and I put it on my calendar. When I review my week, I look at how many hours I spent doing delegatable tasks and I will review what they are. If there's a common theme in those, I can say, okay, maybe I can either hire somebody to do this specifically depending on how many hours it is, uh, how much revenue is produced by doing it, or I can maybe outsource it to a VA or we can build that into somebody else's work. There's a lot of options you can do, but what I want to know before I just start hiring people willy-nilly for no reason, is what are those specific things that I believe I can delegate? Same thing with my business partner. And maybe we can combine our calendars to say, we're both wasting combined, I don't know, let's pick out a number, 15 hours a week on delegatable activities. Things that do not have to be done by us, but are important enough to be done. Let's hire a VA for 15 hours a week. We'll identify and build processes for these specific things. So there's no questions. There's no really onboarding or training period. And as soon as we can get to that point, we can then hire that person and reclaim 15 hours of our time versus the normal path is just saying, ah, I'm overwhelmed. I don't know what to do. Let's hire three people and hope they can pick up the slack. When you do that, you throw people into chaos and they hate their jobs and they're also ineffective and you think they're bad employees, but mostly because you just haven't trained them or told them really what the outcome is that they should be getting. Now, somebody probably didn't ask me if I don't ask you this question. What is the neon sign um, behind you and what is that? Obviously, it's a question, upside down question mark, but what is the symbolism of that? Yeah, so there's there's two things about me that people always ask me. Um, I host a podcast as well. It's called Harmonious at Lunch. Uh, it's on all podcast platforms and YouTube if you want to go check it out. But yeah, so the question mark behind me, that is our logo. So I can't tell now. I think my screen is reversed. The way it should look is what if our company name is spelled with a D, W-H-A-D-I-F. That is supposed to be the D in the word what if. But it's it's really, it's more than that. It's a symbol, right? So everything we do, being fractional COOs and consulting with our clients, we want to go in and instead of asking the normal questions, we want to turn their questions upside down. And we want to ask the things that nobody's ever thought to ask because that's where the true answers in business are. So we turn questions on their head, right? But then the other part, the green part on top is for me personally, arguably the most important. And it's actually a play button. So that just means we're having fun. If you're not having fun in business, you're doing something wrong because you can always, fun is a choice. You can always choose to have a good time and have fun in anything you're doing. And that's just one of our core beliefs. So we're asking the questions that nobody wants to ask uh, or nobody has thought to ask. And we're going to have a party while we do it in the most professional way possible, of course. And the other thing too is uh, I have a mug with the Princess Belle from Beauty and the Beast on, on it. And I was ashamed about this in the beginning of my podcast journey. And then people just started to point it out. Like, are you drinking from a princess? I'm like, you know what? Yeah, I am. I'm a man too. Okay. So you're going to have to deal with it. So the, those two things people ask me all the time, but at this point, that's just my brand. Are you, um, I got, a, I got this question off of your, I think off of your pop mic, um, but 
the question is, are you running your business or is it running you? Mm. That's one of my favorite questions to ask people. And it usually uh, usually gets them a little upset. Not our intention by any means, but it's it's one of those things where you just have to be honest with yourself, right? Because most people get into business for uh, one of two reasons, time freedom or financial freedom. Um, the other, other things that could look like is they want control over their schedule and their life. They want to take vacations. It all boils down to those two things. So when you start a business for those two things, what ends up happening very quickly is the business kind of morphs into its own thing without a structure, without a, a very clear plan and a path for how to get from A to B. And we build ourselves jobs and your business owns you. So that's just the question I ask people. That and the other question I ask them is, can you take a three-week vacation without uh, your business losing revenue and or profit? And that question really makes people angry. But it's just, again, it's to open your eye. My goal is to not offend you. It's to open your eyes and say, back to that other question before, what do you want? Why did you start this business? And what do you want from it? And if you want to grow, why do you want to grow? Again, if you are happy, content with your business, and you're working 80 hours a week. I have met those people. There's no shame in that. That's totally fine. If you are on your path, by all means, please keep doing exactly what you're doing. But if you want something different, if you want something more, if you're not serving in the highest level that you believe you should be or could be, then you may have to ask yourself one of those two questions and just take a look at how you're running your business or is it truly running you? Teams are made up of different folk with different ideas. And things can get messy. How does Harmonious help everyone trust each other and communicate clearly, even when things get bumpy? Yeah, so Harmonious uh, is the business operating system. And instead of the normal approach to business where, if you think of any company, really, what comes to mind is departments or silos, right? So you have your marketing department, your sales team, you have your HR department. And where that model breaks down is in especially larger companies, these departments tend to compete with each other for resources, whether consciously or subconsciously. Everybody knows that there's only so much money to go around for bonuses, salaries, time off, all that fun stuff. So every department is trying to perform at its highest level and do the best job that it can while not realizing that they're actually taking resources from potentially another department. So it becomes, instead of a team environment, it becomes a very much like flesh-eating bacteria environment, uh, and it deteriorates very quickly. So what we argue is that instead of looking at business in that context, when you have a harmonious business, you actually connect everything, and everything feeds off each other. So when we talk about uh, communication, and whether that's one-on-one -on -one or team-to-team, department-to-department, if you want to use that language, it's not about how are my activities helping me in my role, because the first thing we do with people is tie their personal mission, vision, and purpose to the company's mission, vision, and purpose. So they know how all of their activities in their job affect them in their personal lives and the company, and then also everybody around them too. So the first thing we want to do when we go in and consult with people is bring the team together and the culture together. So it's never like, how can I get the most milk out of this role and get the most money and the biggest bonus? It's if we all win, we're all going to win. And that, I mean, that sounds stupid to say it like that, but it's so true. The more you can build a collaborative team working environment where no single person loses ever, then you have the highest likelihood of success. And one of the things I always like to say is, uh, or an analogy is every deal that I go into, that we go into, and think of anything as a deal. If you ask me to go get you a cup of coffee, that is a deal. So it could be as little as that or as big as like a hundred billion merger. If we can't cut the pie and have everybody be happy with their slice, it's not good enough. And that's just one of those very foundational principles, especially for communication, that if someone is trying to win and make someone else lose, your culture is already destroyed and you need to take a step back and rebuild it. For someone, this is going to be the last question, but for someone who, whose business 
for whatever reason, may have failed, and they want to go back into the business world or maybe even, you know, create a new business, what encouragement would you have for them? Your business didn't fail. You just did some things that you can learn from. So I, I think they're in a better position than someone starting a business for the first time because there's so many things you learn from being in business and then if in that scenario going out of business that you can start to see the future in some regards the next time. Like you know what patterns to look for and say, oh, I did this last time and it actually turned out poorly because I had to close my business. So I'll take all of those lessons, all of those learnings and make sure it's something that you actually want to pursue again. The other side of that coin too is entrepreneurship is not for everybody. And I think we glorify it uh, like on social media and stuff and we make it look easy. And there's all these influencers taking cool pictures with uh, like the crystal clear blue ocean in the background. Like that is not entrepreneurship. If you're going to build a company and build a team, you are now responsible for making other people's lives better spreading your mission and making an impact in the world. We don't look at entrepreneurship as like making a lot of money. It's making a lot of impact. That should be your goal. So if you have an area of your life, you feel called to make an impact, make a difference and change something, that could be a nonprofit too. I mean, there's no limit to what you can do in the scope of entrepreneurship and business ownership. You didn't get the result you wanted last time. How can you use that to serve your goals moving forward and make sure that doesn't happen again. But just shift that focus a little bit. You got to be impact driven, mission focused, and very, very clear on where you want to go. And then always seek help. Doesn't have to be me, but always I have never in my life been without a coach or a mentor in my business journey. And it's been one of those things that I can say has hands down paid for itself 10 times over every single time. You, you need outside guidance. Now that I have found God too, I will say, I told you before how I feel. I just at peace, at ease. Make sure you keep that. You keep God first in your business at all times. And then everything else will start to come into place. He will deliver those resources for you. But man, if you're not uh, focused on the right things, it's very easy to get off track. And I always want to ask my guest to give one encouragement to my listeners as well. Oh man, um, so it's just something that's been on my heart recently is Romans eight twenty eight, basically that God does all things for the good of people who believe in him and follow in him. And that's it's been a verse that I've carried with me for a while now. And it's been a source of encouragement for me. So hopefully if you need to hear that, go read Romans, really the whole chapter, Romans 8. Fantastic, uh, fantastic chapter. You'll, you'll get a lot of encouragement from that. Thank you. Thank you, Brendan, so much for coming on the show today. We greatly appreciate having you. Thanks for having me. This was awesome. Thank you guys and girls for listening again. And please like and share and leave a review on all podcast platforms. And if you would like to uh, donate and consider donating to the Dorsey Show to continue to help me produce more great contact content, Please uh, do that on the links in the show notes. And until next time, God bless. Bye-bye. Thank you again for joining Dorsey Ross on this episode of The Dorsey Ross Show. Please like, share, and tell others about the show. Also, please check out the other podcast episodes. And if you would like, donate to this podcast and buy Dorsey a coffee. Thanks again for tuning in, and we'll catch you in the next episode.